Welcome to Poster House. Has anybody not been here before? Oh, well, you. Wow, okay. Well, we're the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. Uh, you're in our exhibition space for mass vigilantes and silent motorbikes right now, so please wander around when you're done. This is all artists who take posters from the street and transform them into a different work of art. And I believe one of the artists is in the room this evening. He did those. Well, they're way over there. They're great. Um, but tonight we're going to focus on Stephen Heller's new book, Growing Up Underground. Um, I'm assuming you all know who Stephen Heller is because you came this evening. This isn't like something you just wander into. So I'm not sure he needs much of an introduction other than you're an enemy of the state. You're a prolific design writer. I'm a product of the state. You're a product of the state. Well, you're also an appointment baby, according to this book. Yes. Um, and. You and, and you, usually I'm used to reading your design work, hundreds of books that you've written. How is writing this different than writing the other books that you've done before? Was the process different in some way? More angst. More angst? Yeah. More heartache. More worry. And now I'm suffering from PMS. Me post too. Post-memoir syndrome. <laughs> but this is only a small chapter of your life. You say that there, I've heard you do interviews about this book before, and you say there might be part two and part three in the future. I didn't say that there would be. I implied that there might be. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. This, yes. There and a lot has to do with age and memory. Okay. What would the other books include that aren't included in here? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, now you notice the book that I have in front of me has a gazillion t uh, little post-it notes sticking out of it. And I like your post-it notes. Thank you. I think I stole them from my grandmother's house. They're covered in roses. Um, and uh, I figured we'd do a Russian roulette style Q&A, mostly because you've done this interview, you've been promoting this book for a little bit now, and I worry that all of the interviews are always the same, like they're going to ask you the same five questions. Actually, nobody's asked me the same five questions. Well, Maybe I didn't want to be the first the tenth, one. Tenth, ten same questions. No, everybody has a different take, and I'm sure you will too, because I trust you. That's a dangerous thing. Um, but the, I use the post-it notes that I might be able to get different questions and also remember them. So um, I'm going to let you grab a post-it note of your choosing, oh, and from is... there I will... Okay. There you go. All right. So, okay, so you did a lot of the early cartoons and illustrations for a lot of underground magazines. Do you ever teach in your classes that you've... Do you ever teach the designs that you did? No. Why? They were awful. So you don't even use them as examples of, of, of what you shouldn't do? No. I, uh, I've never really shown them. I've given them to my son, who is in the audience. I don't know what he's done with them. Um, I've published them once in a journal called the Gansfeld. And I thought it was mercifully destroyed or hidden somewhere, and somebody just wrote me about them, <laughs> uh, a collector. Um, but no, they, they were done because they were therapy, therapy that became kind of obsession for uh, getting my traumas out into the open. I, I used them when I was younger to express my inner rage. And now I express my inner rage at interviews. <laughs> I thought you said you trusted me. <laughs> take, don't take it personally. Thank you. Uh, pick your other. Pick. All right. I did all of these in a flight from Wisconsin, so. She was at the, uh, in the place that invented the hot fudge sundae. Twin Rivers, Wisconsin. Oh, okay. I'm like, what did I write here? Okay, in, your, in the book, you talk about how your manuscripts tend to be as redacted 
as an FBI file with like lots of bits crossed out. Having, Steve and I are working on an exhibition right now, and I, you accidentally sent me a rough draft that had all of your notes in it, so I can attest to the fact. I'm all right. Okay. <laughs> Remember you wanted me to croak. The, true, we were, we were saying that we would capitalize on Stephen Hiller's death if he died during this interview. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, I, so you sent me a, a rough draft of your work, not knowing that all of the, it had all your notes of what was redacted and what wasn't. So I can attest to the fact that yes, your work writing tends to be complete, like have hemorrhaged all over it with, with redactions. Um, tell me more about your writing process though. Why so many redactions? I'm the, I'm the kind of person that's like one and done. Well, because I don't feel comfortable as a writer. Uh, I never studied writing although I was an English major at NYU until I was thrown out, uh, probably for not writing English. Um, I tend to reread, and I used to sing my texts. I would try to get a melody out of them. You know, I'd, I'd be thinking of a Beach Boy song, and so I'd sing according to Beach Boy music. Um, I used to do that with uh, Dr. Seuss when my son was a baby. I would sing the book. And I later found out that that was what Seuss had in mind, that it had a, a melody to it. And so it didn't matter what melody you put on it, but it, it, you'd come around to getting a rhythm. Mm -hmm. So I used to do that. And if I couldn't get the melody, I'd cross out something and put another word in. And in the memoir case, it's more, uh, I'd write something and i think, who's going to hate me for this? And then I'd take it out. There, there is one part in the book where you'd say that you, um, you've published everything you've ever written. Um, have you ever, Just about. Have you ever regretted that? Well, no, I don't regret anything. Uh, I might be embarrassed for a little while, but editors were invented for me. Uh, there are some great editors who have taken my prose and whipped it into shape. And uh, it's always easy if you are an editor to know when I've been touched and when I haven't been. But I will publish just about anything I've written because I feel like if I've done it, I can't let it go to waste. It's like somebody who stores a lot of food in the icebox. That's very much me. I think I, think I found a turkey from like 2020 recently in my fridge. I would have eaten it. Um, one thing that you talk about, nope, that thought just threw, hit my, threw, left my mind, so I'm going to go with uh, this post-it note instead. <laughs> um, oh, so you write a lot of the obituaries for the New York Times, particularly for designers. Right. Um, how did you get that job, is my first question, and do you write all of them in advance? And if so, who, who are we waiting to go so we can um, hear what wonderful things you've written about them? Well, I don't write them any longer, but because they were getting too close for comfort. Uh, but it started because I would always get calls about designers or illustrators that had died, and I'd have to go to the obit editor and say, this is worth an obit. And so they'd assign it to somebody on staff. They didn't, they had fixed obit writers, but they also had writers in different desks who would write about their specialties. Mm -hmm. And it got to a point where there were so many designers going that they asked me to come in and pitch in. So the first one I did was Paul Rand. And Rand and I were close. Uh, it was the day before Thanksgiving, I remember that. And uh, I wrote it and it felt great that he wasn't going to see it. <laughs> and yell at me. Um, and then it just, as it happened, 
two other very important designers died within two weeks of that, and I did those obits. And I'd always get calls at strange hours or in places like we'd be in Italy, and I got a call that a former uh, colleague of mine passed away, and I'd have to put everything aside and write the obit. Uh, so I became the angel of death. People would call, somebody would have passed, I would have to make a case for why they deserved an obit in the Times. And I had a couple of very open and willing editors at that time, so most of what I proposed got in. Which were the ones that didn't make the, were the times like they're not famous enough? I don't think we should talk about those people. Oh my. Because I can't remember. <laughs> Which one was the last one you wrote? I don't remember. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Quite all right. Um, it's, it's amazing that you constantly refer to yourself in this book as, as a failed student, that you weren't a good student, and yet you are basically like the cornerstone of, of design writing. Um, how did you make that transition from being a so-called failed student to being this, this, um, this expert in the field that people look to for knowledge on design? Well, I always had an aspiration to be a good student. And uh, in high school, I was a, a decent student in my freshman year. And then something happened that I wrote about in the book that kind of turned me off to education. Mm -hmm. um, I just couldn't uh, keep my mind on what I was supposed to do. In fact, I did a history paper once where I did, uh, the cover of this history paper was a, a cartoon, a four panel cartoon of uh, the history of racism. And when I got the paper back, it was all about isms to begin with. And when I got the paper back, the history teacher had written A for the cartoon, D for the paper. So I figured that was a sign. Speaking of teachers, you, you mentioned at one point that there was this one teacher who wore the, the enemy of the state button that I, that I kind of alluded to at the beginning, and that um, kind of inspired you to, to, to start wearing buttons. Um, I've been to your office and to your, your house, and you are a uh, prolific collector of, of odds and ends. Did that kind of like interest in buttons start your interest in ephemera? Um, and, and looking at ephemera in a different way, or what, what, and if not, what did? Well, it didn't. It just so happened that I got that button when I was at a Fugs concert. Anybody know who the Fugs were? Okay, well, the Fugs uh, got their name from a Hemingway, a Norman, Norman Mailer book where he couldn't use the word fuck. So he kept saying, Fug you, or fugging this, and they called themselves the Fugs, and they would play at a place called The Bridge on St. Mark's Place, mm -hmm. which was next to Different Drummer Clothing Store, where I bought my German uniform. Um, and that's another story. Um, and I was standing in the lobby after the, the set was over, and one of the members of the Fugs, Thule Kupferberg, came out, and he saw the pin, and he saw me, and he said, you're not a Fugs person. And that just ruined my, my evening, and ruined my life. And years later, when he came to show me his work to get a job, I didn't give it to him. <laughs> He's dead. Did you write the obit? No. Okay. Um, so you, you mentioned a different drummer clothing company. We actually in our in our first pop up we had the or actually in the in the Freak Power show for um, 
that we had a few years ago, we had the original Different Drummer Clothing poster, as well as in the Peter Max show. And then also in, in the book, you mentioned the Electric Circus, and right. Tommy Unger did the posters for the Electric Circus, which obviously I'm picking out all the poster stuff in the book. As did Chumayev. Yep. I'm in Chumayev. Um, do you have any memories of the Electric Circus? I have many memories of the Electric Circus. Uh, Are we allowed to hear any of them? Well, they're hazy. There are many hazy memories. Uh, Velvet Underground was there, and mm -hmm. that's where I became aware of them. But more to, central to my life was the Fillmore East, and across the street, the Anderson Theater, and across, sir, uh, across town on Avenue B or A was the Charles Theater, mm -hmm. where uh, Putney Swope used to play, uh, and uh, great Bergman films were there. And then in another direction was the New York Academy of Music, which became the Palladium. And I used to work on productions at the Academy of Music when I was art director of Rock Magazine. We used to put on all these shows. So I, that was a whole music scene in the East Village that uh, I was peripherally part of. The Electric Circus was less pleasant than some of these other places. And the Fillmore was great because it was this old Lowe's Theater that I went to when I was a kid. And the uh, same with the Academy of Music. It was like out of a hopper painting. Um, but that whole St. Mark's place was, you know, just hippie city. The button, the I'm an enemy of the state, came from uh, Randy Wicker's shop. He was like the first person to sell buttons in New York City. And, you know, they were, they were like mini posters. So when you put together a poster house that's really just about this big, Mic Tiny mic micro, micro house. house yeah. uh, you can get those buttons. Oh, we have a button making machine that Salvador operates every now and then, so we should get any of the state buttons. Um, you, you, you talked briefly just now about, about your time at Rock Magazine. One anecdote that I wasn't expecting was that you worked with Patti Smith while, while, while there. Yeah. What was that like? Well, that was like... Nothing, in the sense that we hired this person to be a writer, a reporter, and I kind of liked her. She was fun. Um, she kept saying how much she wanted to be a rock and roll star, and uh, kind of never let up on that uh, theme. And she mentioned a couple of people that I knew of and liked a great deal and was impressed that she knew. One of them was Sam Shepard, the playwright, who I used to, I didn't go to his performances, but I read his mm -hmm. plays. And uh, we went to one of the concerts that we put on at the Academy of Music together. It was the only um, contemporary concert. Everything else was doo-wop. And this one had, as, a, as the headliners, Linda Ronstadt, who I adored, Van Morrison, who was quite a star, and Tim Buckley, who was really good. And in this theater that had sat 2,500 people, we had for four shows 500 people, because the producer that I, I worked with, who was also the publisher of Rock, who fired Patti Smith, um, didn't account for the fact that all the Rock palaces in the New York City area were filled with big acts. Mm -hmm. There was one in Rye, New York, and the Fillmore, of course, and uh, the Anderson. They all had the super acts. And so we got the dregs of the, the uh, audience for really amazing performances. In the th theater, there was a big orchestra pit, 
And for four shows, I just sat in that orchestra pit and stared up at, you know, Van Morrison doing his thing. And Linda Ronstadt basically alone on the stage. She had a backup band someplace. But Patty and I went to that show together and uh, we, I lost track of her in the theater and she just never came back to rock because, uh, as I said, the producer slash publisher uh, didn't like her writing. It was too lyrical. <laughs> Don't think that was a long-term problem for her. No, I ran into her. Her kids went to my son's school, um, Little Red, and I saw her on the street one day and I said, you're not going to remember me, but, and she said, oh yeah, I remember. And I said, she said, what are you doing? And I said, I, art director of the book review section. And she looked at me a little hazed and said, they just gave me a bad review. <laughs> and that was the extent of our in, in <laughs> conversation. Switching it back to a lot of your, your writing and, and art directing, how did you convince a lot of the major illustrators from like Time, Newsweek, and the New York Times to, to, to work for Screw? If that's for me, I'm not here. Um, they were working for me before they went to the Times. So you brought them back? Um, some of them continued to work for me. I mean, Brad Holland, who I write about, extensively in the book, uh, worked for all the papers that I did. And then he got picked up by the Times. But th the Times connection is another story. Uh, the art director of the op-ed page where I got my first Times job was the first art director to ever hire me out of high school. Mm -hmm. So we knew the same people. And he basically took those artists who were terrific in the underground and brought them into the Times. And then from the Times, they go into Newsweek Time, Red Book, uh, every other mainstream place. Do you think that, I mean, when you got hired by these places, like you just said, you were a teenager, and that would probably not really happen anymore. Do you think that there's been a, like there some- There are no more teenagers? There, well, there are no more teenagers. <laughs> Nobody's going to hire a teenager to work at the New York Times um, doing illustration, generally speaking. Do you think that there's been something lost in basically requiring um, art students to go to art school before they can be art directors? No, but I think to be an art director, you don't have to go to art school. Uh, you have to have a passion for whatever it is you're going to be art directing but you could pick it up. There are no classes in art direction anyway. You, you're taught to be a designer, or you're taught to be an illustrator, or you're taught to be an illustration designer, but you're not taught how to be an art director. You have to kind of fit into it. Uh, it's partly being a curator. It's partly uh, being a Rolodex. It's partly being a reader. Uh, it's partly having a certain amount of arrogance, enough to get through editorial constraints. Uh, but I think going to school is very valuable now. If, if for no other reason, there are so many technologies that one should learn. I mean, I feel like I've become totally incompetent. I don't let the students know that. But I do let them teach me more than I teach them. Uh, when I left the Times, they gave me a nice pension. They gave me all the stuff I had in my office, which I could, had to throw out anyway. And uh, they kept the programs. I, I just never learned how to use Photoshop or InDesign. It's like if you come to this country from a foreign land and you're five years old and you speak the language, you speak as a five-year-old. And that's the way I handle design now. I, I can use Keynote, so I use Keynote to do what Photoshop does. 
or I use Keynote to do what InDesign does. It's workarounds. I'm, I'm very good at doing bad workarounds. Uh, one thing you, you do mention um, is that you were taught like underground, the, the layout tricks no, um, associated most with underground magazines. How do those tricks uh, differ visually for the design nerds in the room from more established like the New York Times? Well, drawing a straight line, for example. Uh, straight lines were either, in my day, drawn with a rapidograph or a techno or you used ruling tape. Mm -hmm. And when I used a techno, uh, it always blotched up. So the straight line would always have a bump in it. Um, if I had gone to uh, Yale, I would have learned how to draw a straight line. OK. <laughs> oh, um, in the chapter on your mentor, uh, you talk about the ethics of making art. Have your ethics evolved or changed throughout your career? Well, the ethics of making art, according to Brad Holland, was you don't just do what you're told to do. That in the 40s, 50s, even early 60s, the art director gave you the idea. And the idea was usually uh, an echo of the text, and it was meant to illustrate the text. The ethic that Brad Holland taught me was you contribute to the text, you supplement or complement it, but you do your own ideas. And if an art director says, uh, this is all wrong, put in such and such a symbol, you reject that. And if you lose the job, you lose the job. So I, I, the part of that that I got, because I had given up drawing early on, but as an art director, I would never look at sketches. I would only look at finished work. And if the finished work didn't quite match up to what I was looking for, I would just say, do it again. And I'd, I might put a little directorial English on it, but not much. There is a moment in the book where you talk about this time where you um, were uh, a hostile witness yes. um, in Kansas against an, in an obscenity trial. Um, but that you were kind of the star witness and that you, you got the trial thrown out. Can you, what, what exactly did you say? Well, that is at the end of a bigger story. I was the art director of Screw, the founding art director of Screw, and I did two sex papers, New York Review of Sex and Screw. And when I left the New York, for the New York Times, it was from Screw. I was hired because of my screw portfolio, which surprised everybody, including me, and including the top brass at the Times, who would always joke about it. Um, but about a month after I had left uh, screw, I got subpoenaed by the, uh, a grand jury in uh, Kansas City, Kansas which was the hub of the United States Postal Service. And they were suing, or they were prosecuting uh, Screw, Screw's publishers, Al Goldstein and Jim Buckley, for pandering through the mails. And when I was at Screw hiring the illustrators who were at the New York Times and the Newsweek and Time, I knew that if I could, if Screw ever got in a position where they were going to do some First Amendment hijinks with them, all I had to do, because the Supreme Court said uh, pornography is community standards and it's al it also has to show a level of uh, social or cultural value. 
So I could say, in addition to all the dirty pictures we ran, I had these people who worked for these major publications. And when I got up on the, when I went before the grand jury, I didn't have to say any of that. They gave me the words to say, the district attorney, because uh, they knew they would bring in an indictment. So when I went back for the trial, uh, our lawyer was prepared with large blow-ups of some of these great covers by Brad Holland and Ed, Ed Sorrell and people like that, Milton Glaser. And uh, the prosecutor showed these big blow-ups of dirty pictures, or shall we say, compromised pictures. And uh, he asked me what I thought of them, and I told the truth. I said, you know, they're, I didn't use the word pornography, I used the word uh, risque. And he would say, you mean pornography? And I said, well, I mean risque. And he couldn't make any, he couldn't get me to say what he wanted to say. And after he rested his examination, our lawyer, Harold Price Farringer, who also was the lawyer for Claus von Bülow, if anybody remembers him, and Gene Harris, who killed the diet doctor. He lost both of those cases. Um, but he was a, a hotshot lawyer, and he just put up the blow-ups and said, so tell us about this picture. And all I had to do was a narrative of their resume. And the jury came in a day or two later uh, with a not guilty verdict. Uh, what I loved about the trial was the prosecutor's wife sat in the front row behind the prosecutor knitting. So she was like Madame Lafarge. And uh, Al Goldstein was so pleased to get off, he invited the entire jury to New York for a dinner and a show from Kansas. Did any of them take him up on that? All of them did. Oh. <laughs> um. Oh, you, you, you talk a little bit about your, your, your perceived failure as a cartoonist and an illustrator. Um, how important do you think failure is in creating a career? Well, I wrote a book on, on failure. I forget what it was called. I fail to remember. <laughs> um, although the cover was quite nice because all the type was being cut off the side of the cover. <laughs> Um, I think failure is really important. Uh, now, if I didn't fail, I wouldn't say that. But I feel like you have to try things out and therefore not be afraid of failure. Uh, there are many perfectionists who just won't allow themselves to fail. And, you know, if you fail too often, it means you're not very good. <laughs> But if you fail a few times, that's part of the process. So being, you know, now people look at those drawings that I did and they say, those were actually pretty good. And uh, only I know for sure. It's kind of like the, uh, was it, there was a hair color commercial uh, in the old days, only so-and-so knows for sure. Only your, only your hairdresser, only, only your, your colorist knows for sure. Only your hairdresser knows for sure. So only my hairdresser knows that my cartoons really were not that good. Well, dovetailing on that, what was, if, there, if there's one in particular, like one of the most important moments that, 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 is, that changed your, your, your career to becoming an art director, like the, mo the biggest lesson you learned in, in that process? The biggest lesson I learned was that uh, I could do almost anything. And if it wasn't quite perfect, I could still do it. And so uh, when I was at Screw, I tried anything typographically, because Goldstein couldn't care less. Uh, so I. We bought a phototypositor. Some of you may know what a phototypositor was. And I just, my 
model what I, the person who was my hero as a typographer was Herb Lubalin, who my wife worked for. And he did this smash type number. And you could do that easily on a phototypositor because you just, it's, it's all film. So that, that changed my life uh, professionally. Uh, the other thing that changed my life professionally was uh, psychotherapy. Uh, when I said I couldn't do something, the therapist said, try it. The worst that you can do is fail, so there's failure. And so I tried things that I got away with. Toward the end of the book, there's um, a moment where you're talking about the, I believe it's the art director at Rampart magazine? Yeah. Um, whose name is escaping me. Dougald Sturmer. Yeah. And you, you, you had like profound admiration for him. Yes. Is there one particular work by him or one thing he did that, that really impacted how you wanted to art direct? Well, he did a magazine. Does anybody know Ramparts? One person. <laughs> uh, or two. And there's a third. Do I hear a fourth? <laughs> Ramparts was a West Coast political magazine. Uh, it like the Evergreen Review? It was the West Coast version of Evergreen Review, except there were major differences. It was run by a guy named uh, Hinkle, um, who was a, a journalist. Uh, and it was a formerly liberal Catholic magazine that was against the war and taken over by Warren Hinkle. And Dougald Sturmer was put in charge of art direction. He was also an illustrator. And he did pages that were just beautiful to look at. They weren't flashy. He used very conservative type, serif type, maybe it was Times Roman. He used nonpareil borders around each page, which I liked because it had this crusty classical look. And he hired great illustrators. And uh, I used to look at the names of art directors in magazines, like Holiday was a very big deal for me. Frank Zachary was the art director of Holiday. And when I met him, I was you know, in heaven. And we later became friends. I did his obit for the Times. I did Dougal's obit for the Times. I did a lot of people who, who were uh, heroes of mine for the times. Um, but Evergreen was, uh, I mean, Ramparts was one of those magazines that felt like I wasn't alone in the world. Uh, that some place had the same kind of political instincts that I had, which were not very well formed, but they were, they were there. And most of it was centered around the Vietnam War and the CIA. Uh, it turns out that a number of the Ramparts crowd became right-wingers because it never really had an ideological base. It just had a kind of contemporary aura. And there's a difference between being against something and having an ideology. So Ramparts kind of fell into that category. But it was a great magazine. Evergreen Review was a great magazine. I always wanted to work there. Uh, I went when I was 14 or 15 to show my portfolio to the art director, Ken Deardorff. And two or three years later, he called me. He was leaving. And he asked me if I wanted to be art director. Now, this was after not talking to him for three years. But he took photographs of my cartoons and kept them in a little box. So as far as ethics go, he taught me a great lesson, and that is always look at somebody's best work not, and judge them by the two or three pieces that are really terrific or, or come close to being terrific in their work. And uh, it was a good thing to learn. So I became the last art director of Evergreen Review was that the time when the Paul Davis did the Che Guevara poster? Or no, that was much later. Paul, because you did an yeah. exhibit of 
Che, the Che poster. No, that's when Evergreen Review got bombed by the Cuban. That's why I was asking. I was like, were you there when it was bombed? No, but I lived across the street on 11th Street mm -hmm. uh, shortly after the bombing. Mm -hmm. I figured I might as well be where the bombings go because yeah. no one was hurt as it turned out. Actually, speaking of the Pushpin show, which is what the Che Guevara poster was in, you also mentioned that you hired Pushpin to do some work for you every now and then. What was it like working with people that you were also friends? I mean, you're very good friends with Seymour what, and Milton. What, what was it like working with them professionally? Well, that was the first time I ever met them. They weren't oh. friends. They were kind of enemies. <laughs> uh, I was a young, arrogant kid who heard about Pushpin and saw their work and decided I didn't like it. <laughs> but I was being rehired for Screw. I left Screw over an ar argument about the logo, uh, which... Was this the... No, no, that was later. This was something else. It looked like a little snake coming out of the ass of all things. It was disgusting. <laughs> and. Al Goldstein and I got into a fight about the logo and I quit and started my own sex paper with two other people. I was 17. And, uh, but a couple of years go by, I'm working for different things. Uh, Rock, Interview, other publications. And I go back to Screw because they have great health benefits and other benefits. <laughs> and when I went back, I figured I'm not going to go back for a long time. Uh, so I'm not going to take my ego with me. I'll try to get them to design, have it redesigned. And I said, why don't you go to Pushpin? And I th thought of it as a joke, actually. Uh, but they called up Milton Glaser, and he said, we'll do it. And we went to their building, which is now going to be the New York Review of Books building on East 32nd Street. And I remember being in the conference room, which I've been in many times since, and they brought out all their pages. And Seymour, who's my best friend, brought out now, not then, brought out a bunch of really what I vaguely remember as beautiful decorative logo and illustration combinations, the kind of things that he's known for, which I wasn't that crazy about at the time. And Milton brought out something similar, but then he brought out his capstone piece, and it was all Helvetica and light line Gothic. And for those of you who know Helvetica, it's the exit sign right over there, um, which looks like it says Fix. Um, Helvetica is not the kind of type you'd use in a porn paper. But Milton did something rather unique with it. He gave the E an erection. And some people say it was probably one of his best logos, even better than I Love New York. <laughs> um, and he gave us a dummy to work with, a, a template, which I had to follow religiously. And not having the skill, I couldn't follow it religiously. There were always straight lines that I drew that weren't straight. But I hated his design anyway. <laughs> So I took tissue paper and put it over the, the layouts and marked it up, all the things I didn't like about it, and gave it to Goldstein and told him to tell Milton that I didn't like it. I didn't know that Milton was God. Uh, he didn't have a beard then. Um, and so I, I was allowed on the extension phone to hear what Milton had to say, which wasn't nice. And I lost all my battles, and we put the, the issue together, and they had to come to my studio to see it on boards. 
And I had a loft in the same building as Screw. The, Screw had taken over on 17th Street. Uh, a, two lofts that belonged to an S&M mis matron, mistress, or whatever she'd be called, master. Um, and I had the downstairs part, which still had some of her equipment on the wall. <laughs> and I would, I wasn't very tidy. So whenever we'd cut things up, we'd just throw them on the floor. And nobody came in to clean it up. You know, there was no wet garbage. It was all just paper garbage. But it grew and grew and grew. And I even photographed it and put it on a memo pad uh, with memo from the dump. Anyway, Mil Milton and Seymour came. Milton used to wear these kind of hats. Uh, this is my homage to Milton. And uh, they looked at the, the layouts and they passed on them and uh, went to press, came back. They were pleased. I continued to do their layout for at least a year, if not more. And then I took his logo and changed it. I got somebody who I just re uh, got in contact again with with got in contact, to got in contact, you, you understand. Um, and he, I re was reminded that uh, I had him take an airbrush and balloon up the Helvetica so it would look phosphorescent. Mm -hmm. And that became the logo, and then I changed all the inside typography. And by then, I was actually a decent typographer. Um, well, since I'm getting the signal from Salvador, I think it's time for questions if anyone has them. Um, since I've, oh, I'm almost out of post-it notes. <laughs> yes, Michael. Thank you. Um, you spoke earlier about um, your writing and how you sang your words uh, to evaluate how, how good it was going. Have you ever used music in that way later in your career or other aspects of your career visually or art director wise? Or, uh... Not really. Uh, I don't listen to that much music. Uh, I went crazy because Revolver was reissued. <laughs> and anything Beatles or, or Dylan will turn on my switch, but uh, no, music hasn't played a large part other than working for rock and meeting musicians. Anybody else? I'll probably repeat the questions just so it's actually recorded for the people at home. No, that was me pointing at the camera, not at the... Nobody else has a question for Steve? Well then. Oh, yeah, okay, um, yes. Um, do you and Louise write separately when you work together on, on a project? Or so do you and... Is, is, there sort of is there a separation? So is there separation from church and state between you and Louise when you work? Most of the time, but there are times when she bounces things off me, and I certainly bounce things off her. Uh, I write so much, I'm sure she hasn't read all of it. She's here, she could H have you read all of it, that. Louise? Um, working on it. <laughs> um, but there is a separation of church and state. She has a book coming out. Uh, in a couple of months, and I wrote the introduction, but she wrote everything else. And she'd ask me to look at it, and my response would be, I do this all day. I don't, well, I don't want to do it at night. Yes? So I, I bought your book, but I only just started it. I'm sure it'll tell the story when I read it. But I'm just curious, you, know, you talk about being 17 out of high school. I mean, 
mean, how did you, how did you just have the balls to become in this system? I mean, it's like, you know, you just kind of walked in and believed you could do it and you did it? I don't really know. Do you how did to? you have the balls? God gave them to me. <laughs> uh, no, I, it was just natural. It just kind of... I was in a very bad place at a very bad school, and I was released from that school and went to this progressive school called Walden. And there was an art teacher there, Neil Shevlin, whose vision, his paintings, looked like my brain. And we got on, and he liked my cartoons a lot, and uh, got me to do stuff for the school. And he kind of helped me believe that I could do something. Uh, sadly, he killed himself. And uh, I was always troubled that he helped me get out of my dark spot by drawing, and his paintings couldn't save him. Uh, but basically it was just, what was I going to do? Just go home and watch TV? There was nothing on anyway. Um, unless you think I Dream of Genie is worth spending your life doing. Uh, so I took up portfolios and I, there was always somebody to meet and I got lucky and I went to a publication that was actually uh, run by a cult. Uh, it was called Avatar and the guy who ran it, Mel Lyman, had, he had this cult group that he ran. He was like a Jim Jones type character. But I didn't know from cults. All I knew is that my drawings fit their editorial policy. <laughs> I couldn't figure out why. I was <laughs> later told why. But um, once I got published there, I got the bug and became addicted. I mean, I, don't, I didn't, never did drugs, which I t say in the book, not even grass. I will never do drugs. Um, but once I get obsessed about something, I take it to the limit. So when I was working for underground papers, I had to work for as many as I possibly could. And if they said no the first time, I'd go back another time. Mm -hmm. And finally, you know, I became part of the scene. And uh, everybody was kind of trying to find themselves. So if they found somebody that was like you in any way, shape, or form, you were embraced. It wasn't even like it was a meritocracy. It was just, you know, it, it, it's, it was like Tinder or something. I don't know from Tinder, so I could be wrong. But it was like being, I used to be a, a CB radio operator. I had a, a ham ticket, but I never could afford the machinery. But CB, you get on, and you don't know who the other people are, and you just talk about stupid things all the time. I mean, it's kind of like online social media. Uh, and then you meet them, and you're embraced because you're one of them, and that's what happened. I just felt confident in that embrace. You. <laughs> I, I'm going to promote your book. I, um, I read your book. I took it from the library, so I don't have it to get a signature. But it was fabulous. And, um, I Thank you. Can you say that louder? Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the book is fabulous. Fabulous is the good word. Well, also, I have, I have all your other books, and it, your books have helped me 
sold enormously with my graphic design career. And then I read this, and then I didn't know you were such a badass. <laughs> like, it was amazing. It was really great, fascinating story. My only complaint with the book is that I felt like it just ended mm -hmm. too quickly. So will you be writing a sequel that we can I, I'm, I'm with her on this. I thought it just ended very abruptly. Well, I wanted it to end abruptly, kind of like the Sopranos. <laughs> I felt that I was the uh, soprano of graphic design. Just ended, it's <laughs> over. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Because uh, what happens afterwards uh, is about the New York Times and then things I did branching out from the New York Times. But the New York Times took 33 years of my life and while I loved it, the stories that go with the Times are not as uh, meaty to write about as that one 10 year period which you know, like John Reed said, 10 years that shook the world, or 10 days that shook the world minus 10 years that shook my world. But I might. He might. He Fine. Well, I, we have time for one more question according to Salvador, so I'm gonna go with the guy I saw before. Sorry. Um, do you ever have uh, interaction with or influence over uh, Oliphant? I, I knew Oliphant, Pat Oliphant, but he worked for a totally different newspaper. Um, he was also part of an, a generation that did editorial cartoons, which I was never part of. The New York Times, we never did editorial cartoons. We did probably in the early part of the century, the 20th century and late 19th century. But it was a decision that was made that artists wouldn't have an editorial voice, which was fine for a while, and now I think it's changed considerably that artists, in part because of Art Spiegelman cr creating Mouse, and now there's a lot of comics, and to do comics you have to have your own voice. But uh, I remember Pat coming up to uh, the Times once, and it was an honor, and Bill Molden came up, and Tony Auth, and all these guys who did editorial cartoons, which always seemed to be part of the newspaper, and part of the editorial plan of the newspaper, rather than their own uh, vision. And thank you, Steve. And thank Steve. you. Um, everybody, the book is for sale if you would like to buy it. Are you signing books tonight? Yes or no? Sure. You, there is a signing. Uh, so if you get your book, you can have them sign it. And uh, take a look around the shows, too, if you want. We're here.